so good morning uh, to you and um, I will be very quick uh, because we are running late and I would like you to come in and that we have a little bit uh, of a discussion uh, in return because uh, for the rushing through my presentation I will send then a written text which I have from another occasion but which makes uh, similar points uh, to the organizers here so that you then can tonight go to bed and because there's nothing much to do in Berlin you can read it and uh, uh, think through it. So uh, let me start by saying my main point is that I personally and I think you join me in that I love a world without borders because we can travel and we can move and we can speak and uh, all kinds of things. However, a world without borders also, as we increasingly notice, is a world that mainly benefits the fittest and those who are rude and know how to elbow. So my main point is that since we remove certain borders, we may have to think about uh, introducing certain new borders and I will suggest what sort of new borders we might uh, think of. Uh, we are coming out of uh, 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 hundreds of uh, uh, years uh, of uh, uh, privatizing the world, as I would put it. Here we have fought wars and we have killed each other and whatnot in order to create nation states. This is my territory, this is the German territory, this is the Russian territory, this is the US territory, stay out of it. But uh, this uh, the process uh, was uh, completed uh, mainly only in the 1990s after the end of the East-West conflict. It's about nearly to be completed. But while this creation of nation states and the privatization of the world was going on, uh, for reasons of uh, sort of East-West rivalry mainly, holes were punched at the same time into the um, newly established national uh, walls and we moved towards globalization and that especially after the end uh, of the Cold War. Cross-border activities started, free trade, free capital flows, everything started moving including ourselves. And with all these uh, intended uh, economic activity came also unintended things across borders the communicable diseases, the toxic financial products that we just saw which ruined our little savings that we may have had. And so today, I think when you read the papers, which I sort of more deliberately did uh, during the last uh, two weeks, you get the feeling we are living in times of war. And not one war is raging, but many wars are raging. You know? there is. The, are the attacks from, uh, from uh, people who are called the terrorists, there is the war on terror, there are now currency wars going on all over the world where countries are making sure that their uh, currencies are competitive in order to gain um, some advantage on international markets and save jobs at home. We are attacked by the swine flu and by other communicable uh, diseases. And most importantly, uh, what is really coming up is um, the rush and the run and the competition for natural resources because we know by 2030 we may not see much of fossil fuels any longer and therefore we run and energy uh, diplomacy has become very fashionable, has a fine name but is a very crude thing. So we are rushing from crisis to crisis to crisis at a time when we're basically we could have a good life and live longer and live healthier and be more mobile and all of this. Why this? The reason is that together with this openness and in order to open up, uh, we have created policy interdependence uh, among countries. Many of the public goods that we need for our well-being, in addition to the private goods like bread and shoes and clothing and houses and so, many of these public goods have become globalized and our politicians today are hardly able to ensure our the availability of these public goods through national action alone and therefore, uh, uh, because they are so used to being the sovereigns and uh, still think in terms of win-win and zero-sum games and maximizing national profits, they behave like private actors when they appear internationally. Uh, so they haven't realized yet fully that under conditions of openness, 
your national interests are being best pursued through international cooperation. International cooperation today pays and is a, co a compulsion, otherwise you can't have financial stability, otherwise you can't be healthy, otherwise you can't have law and order and live in peace. But then there are these countervailing forces in addition, like the, the, the increasing scarcity of the natural resources of access to the atmosphere to dump the pollution and, and all of this. So we are seeing this big tension between having to cooperate, and even Obama has realized it. He constantly talks about these global issues requiring everybody to come in, but then he dictates the rules, and we Germans do the same thing, so nothing different in Obama's case. And therefore, developing countries who are getting more important say, uh, these days are over where you just dictate rules listen to us, uh, take us also into account, and then we may uh, cooperate. But all of this doesn't happen at yet, and uh, as a result, we are in this tightening web of uh, global crisis, how to get out of it. And there I would like to have your views so that my next presentation will be better. Um, <laughs> so what, what I'm thinking of is the new wall. And uh, I was thinking of my days where I grew up in a Bavarian village, where we were told that you don't throw garbage, and I think in every village it, it's like this the world over, that you don't just throw garbage over your fence no? and dump it all into the middle of the, the common uh, road in the village. No, you collect it, you put it in a bin, and you organize the collection service so that uh, you don't introduce harm to your neighbors now that when living in a big city. I'm being told I can't uh, blast my radio through the neighborhood after 10 o'clock, that I should tone it down. Um, so uh, at the national level, we have realized that uh, if I respect your freedom, my freedom is greater. You know? Then I also don't run the risk that you uh, play piano or uh, do something noisy at night when I want to sleep. So my idea is that what we have to realize is that as a re result of greater openness, we um, have created a world society, and now we have to learn to organize that community and society as we have learned to organize ourselves at the local level within uh, nations. And we should ask ourselves, what are the things that we think we should not spoo any longer across national borders? Yeah? And there, if we were to think in this way, we would inch forward towards a notion of responsible sovereignty. If I want to be sovereign, I should respect your sovereignty, and therefore I should not issue and uh, sell the world over toxic financial products. I should not just send uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and impose global warming on Bangladesh. At the same time, uh, to link uh, to the foregoing uh, session, probably since we have moved towards a um, sort of common shared consensus in the world about not just killing people, you know, uh, maybe we should also expect uh, uh, governments and uh, uh, states as a whole not to spill this psychological externality on us by just, you know, trampling uh, people to death or wiping out whole uh, communities, which may upset many of us because we have learned this norm of uh, human dignity and respect uh, for human life. So my question to you is, um, should we not think of uh, 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 applying the concept of respectful freedom that we have nationally uh, to the international domain and say, would uh, responsible sovereignty help us rein in some of this elbowing and uh, competition and as a result, uh, the, all these crises that are happening now because we, we try to save ourselves rather than cooperate on uh, global challenges. Now, if we were to do uh, uh, this, uh, several or uh, would have such a notion, several other things would follow. Then we would uh, go as voters and probably expect our states 
to act not as this old sovereign and go to international uh, negotiations and bully and just go for narrow-minded national interest, but we would expect them to be intermediaries between the outside and the inside, take global concerns into account when making uh, national policy, recalculate national interest. If I want to win and go home, as Angela Merkel uh, would probably like to go home and say, oh, I did a good bargain there in Cancun next time when we discuss climate change. In the same way, the Indian prime minister or anybody else wants to go home and say, I didn't get pulled across the table. I also have a good bargain. So with a little understanding of mutual gain, we could really get out of many of the blockages in um, which we are caught. However, since uh, you see from my hair color and probably the wrinkles um, that uh, I have grown old by now, I have also realized that there's only one thing that really works in international cooperation. And that is that, yeah, one can spew out new ideas, but then they have to trickle down to each local level they have to be debated by all governments, by all civil society groups in every family and everything. And what I have observed sooner or later, they trickle up to the uh, UN again or to any other multilateral body, and then they get ratified. What becomes agreed in international fora has already happened in the world. All the other agreements that are being fought they are, yeah, they are there. They still have to go through this uh, recycling, this global policy loop formation, but they are not being implemented unless there is a bottom-up globalization process joining the, the um, uh, uh, ideas that bubble up at international levels. So therefore, my suggestion to you is um, um, go home, start the discussion <laughs> on responsible sovereignty, and then you can hope if you only stick to it, and you have to stick to it, you know. Uh, we started discussing gender equity in the mid-60s. Then we had the first global conference in 1975. Now, uh, this is an exception. When I look through the room here, they have made good effort to um, create a gender balance. But in most other fora, especially when I go to energy security meetings, it's all male. And instead of thinking about cooperation, they come with their sables uh, pulled, you know, because of the energy diplomacy and the competition. So my suggestion is go home, uh, only vote for the politicians who stand for responsible sovereignty, create organizations to forge new global norm, so that we reach, hopefully not only in 20 years' time, but maybe in 10 years' time, a new understanding of complementing the current notion of sovereignty that we have that is very much in this private attitude, my state, get out of it, you know, and replace it uh, through a concept of responsible sovereignty. So now your suggestions on how we could do that, or if you like it, or if you think it's stupid. Did I not even take 10 minutes, no, because I didn't see a sign. <laughs> Uh, do we have I any have questions for Professor Dr. Cowell? Thanks. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to sort of give a question back to you. And um, governing globalization, and obviously that would be a sort of a topic for an entire conference probably, but how do you see the role of the internet and of the changes it has brought about, and is there a way at all yeah. to govern the dynamics that come with yeah. it? Shall I collect a few? <laughs> okay, um, hi, um, I'm Miriam, thanks for, I kind of share your views on um, responsible sovereignty, um, but when we're talking about originally from India, so the Kashmir issue is very, very um, close to my heart, um, how do you deal with states that, you know, are so adamant and don't want to give up any part of their territory? I know it comes in conflict resolution, but it's also important to know. Uh, in terms of responsible, who's responsible for the conflict and like why aren't we sitting across the table and dealing with our issues that we have way before. Um, so um, I mean, 
there's no answer to this. And if there was an answer, I guess, you know, the person, it's a million dollar answer. If you can answer, how do you solve the Kashmir issue when you have two nuclear armed states fighting yeah. with each other over the territories? So. Especially being a call myself. Uh, <laughs> yes, I actually wanted to ask you, is that an Indian Where's land? Where's my husband, she wants to ask. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but it's my maiden name. <laughs> because my best friend is also Call, so her last name, so I was just curious. <laughs> Okay, Thank anybody you. else, yeah? Right, um, you mentioned that um, we, we act responsibly and on a national level, such as not throwing garbage over the neighbor's fence, um, and that we see that n as not being a problem, but wouldn't you agree that it is partly due to the, well, rule of law that exists nationally that is kind of not really implemented internationally as, heard, as we heard today earlier? If, if any rule of law exists, then it takes years and years for anybody to get punished for their act, yeah. actions. So wouldn't that be a problem on an international level? Yeah, good. You, you made a very good point in mentioning that internet, oh sorry. You made a very good point in mentioning that international law is a reflection of cultural norms that already exist and have trickled up, but there, it works in both directions, I would suggest, and that is that uh, once an international treaty of some kind, for instance, in international humanitarian law is enacted and has gone into force, it's also normative, it's also educational, so there's a trickle down in turn as well. Yeah, so since, uh, <coughs> is there any other urgent uh, question you? Hello. Uh, I would also like to come back to your uh, likening of the international stage to what one of the previous persons said, uh, to throwing garbage over the fence. I think on the national stage, I would argue that we do that because of a sense of community. Now, is do you believe that we have that community on a globalized level already, or if not, is it emerging and can we create it? Mm -hmm. Good. So in order to walk my talk and not limit the freedom and opportunities of the successor speakers, I will now answer the question and then yield the podium uh, to you, gentlemen. Um, the internet. Uh, the internet is a fantastic, uh, who was it? Uh, yeah, you. Uh, the internet is a fantastic means for joining forces and uh, getting into touch across the world when thinking about the creation of new norms, creating uh, new approaches to solving policy problems. So um, I, I would see it positively, and, uh, and, and that for the following reason, which is linked to the rule of law question also. Because I think I briefly mentioned that uh, because of this um, uh, compartmentalization of the world in nation states, when states come to the international level, they act like private actors. You know, when when it uh, when we ask who uh, helps finance poverty reduction or meeting climate change costs, we usually tend to look uh, at the Danes, because they have traditionally, I should emphasize, um, been uh, generous donors. So let them pay, and then we are others free rides. So there is a lot of free riding among states going on internationally in the face of global public goods. And this is for the following reason. We have to understand that international cooperation venues are markets. They are political markets because private actors meet and try to exchange policy reforms, either against financial compensation or you undertake a reform and I undertake a, a reform. And it is wrong to think of the states as if they were the same type of actors that they are nationally when they appear internationally. However, in the, uh, and that comes back to the rule of law issue, uh, the international political market like the General Assembly or the climate change negotiations, these markets suffer from all the conditions that we know that make economic markets fail. They are monopol monopolists like the conventional hegemon, 
there are oligopoles, the Northern Transatlantic Alliance or any other alliances that may form. Then there is this free riding in the front of uh, public goods or cross-border externalities. There are informational symmetries. You see Botswana or Lesotho delegation come to Copenhagen or probably now to Cancun with two or three people. The uh, industrial country delegations having thousand in the state delegation in addition to the non-governmental agency. So there are very uneven uh, playing fields and bargaining uh, fields there. And the international political market has not even that much of institutional embedding that economic markets have. And therefore, they feel much more than the economic markets. Uh, we have now learned through the financial crisis that even the economic and financial markets need much more embedding in order to, to be not as crisis-ridden as they are and uh, function uh, 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 more efficiently and therefore, in the end, also more uh, equitably. The Kashmir issue, uh, I mean, uh, I'm not suggesting that by moving towards a notion of responsible sovereignty that this is a silver bullet and suddenly, woof, you know, we live in this wonderful, peaceful, prosperous world. No, but what the notion of responsible sovereignty would probably uh, lead to is that we also recognize that it's not possible, really, that with, this, uh, with the world moving to more multipolarity, for just a few countries to decide the fate of many, we would see more participatory international policy making. And then uh, uh, the concerned parties, even of the Kashmir conflict, uh, may have a better chance to also uh, discuss with whatever superpowers we see in future to, to bring in their concerns uh, in there, or Pakistan or, or whatever other. Uh, country. So we, we probably, with such a notion of responsible sovereignty, we would also lead to a more, um, uh, not really, I mean, de democratic in the traditional conventional sense, but a more participatory decision-making uh, process uh, in the world on uh, uh, key issues. Does the process work in both ways? Yes. Uh, 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 when you think of human rights norms or also the genocide uh, 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 norms that have emerged, often they have been kicked up internationally by leaders because they had a certain backing nationally. But then they are going through this policy loop process a thousand million and uh, trillion times until they firm up and really become part of the global normative framework. And I think what is, when you think back how the world was in 1945, 1950 or so, in the meantime, quite a thickening of the global normative framework has happened. And we are moving towards having more elements of a global society and therefore we feel more as a community. This is a hesitant process. But therefore, you have to think through, I mean, what, what world do we want to see by 2020, 2030, what changes? And then go through this process of adding uh, the, the elements to a thickening, more expanded uh, international global normative framework to embed both the international political markets and by that you would enable the states better to tame the economic markets because today most market failure uh, uh, is due to prior, I'm sorry to say, failure by the state to cooperate. Now that uh, uh, we, we are living in a world of globalization and it, for, for technological reasons, I, I cannot imagine that we ever go back to completely closed borders because we can cross borders and we like in many respects to cross borders, but we have to tame our governments to tame markets. And I look forward to seeing your active internet chats uh, on this issue. So my dear successors, um, the podium is yours.